All right, let's get into this. What are natural units? In order to understand what natural units are, we want to know what are units. So for example, what is a meter? Or if you're being Canadian, a meter. I'm based in Toronto, if that wasn't clear already. What is a second? What is a pound? Now you'll get fairly frenzied if you think about this for quite some time as I have. That is metaphysically what the heck is a second? What is a meter? What is length? Science doesn't answer what is questions. It's operational. Science is metaphysically agnostic, meaning that it doesn't actually make a claim onto ontology. It doesn't tell you what is. Instead, science gives operational meanings. So what is a second? It says here, the second is equal to the duration of 9192631 periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between hyperfine levels of the unperturbed ground state of a cesium atom, a certain isotope of a cesium atom. Okay, so then the natural question that comes up is why this number? So why this and not some other number? And the reason is because in London, many decades ago, someone in some back alley took methamphetamine on a Tuesday night and came up with that number. Now, I'm not kidding. It may as well be that to someone studying high energy physics in the same way that, well, what the heck is a kilogram? What is a kilogram? It means you go to Paris, you go outside Paris, actually. So on the borders of Paris, you go to some vault and you deal with people being condescending to you because you don't speak French. Then you duplicate this little metal slab that's in Paris. You duplicate it 67 times so that you have 68 of them in total. I'm just being quick with my writing. 68 of them is in total. And then you measure yourself on a scale and these two numbers will coincide. That's what it means. It's an operational definition. Now, physicists like to use units that appear in nature. So units that appear and those we call natural units. There's some controversy with what's considered natural because when someone comes to you with a some dish and they say this is a natural dish and that's unnatural. Well, what do you mean that, that those Doritos that are unnatural? Did they come from outside this universe from some void? Because isn't everything in this universe natural? Aren't we a product of nature and so what we create is natural? Okay, what a physicist means by natural is that it's invariant across the universe, as far as we can tell. To be extremely precise, what we mean when we say natural units, natural in the natural units, is natural with respect to our current understanding in order to make certain equations simpler and remove arbitrary human qualities. Why do I say arbitrary human qualities and not just human qualities? Well, in some sense, even an electron is a human construct in the sense that it's there because it nature doesn't parse itself out into these elements. I mean, you can say elementary. Elementary seems to be an objective quality because of the way that we define what an elementary particle is. It's an irreducible representation of something. So the fact that it's irreducible means if it could be reduced in this block matrix form, then we can just decompose it and we'd say those elements are elementary. But the reason why we set aside some special canonical place for the electron is because it's useful for us. It makes our models easier to understand, simpler Occam's razor, etc. There, there's plenty of philosophy that undergirds natural. This is not usually explained and you'll be led astray if you don't understand that point. Now here's another point that's ordinarily not explained. Observables have no units. They're dimensionless. Let's say slash ratios. Okay, now what's meant by that? Again, when you say that you weigh 68 kilograms, it means you take 68 of some other reference quantity, some other reference object, and then you stack 68 of them and then, and then you get yourself. It's actually 68. It's not 68 kilograms per se. You can also think of this in another way. If you wanted to speak to aliens, which by the way is another topic on this channel, not speaking to aliens per se, but UFOs, then it would be foolish to say I weigh 68 of some product from France. Now you can reverse this and imagine an alien is speaking to you and you say, well, how much does your craft weigh? And they say, oh, it weighs four gar bars. And then you're like, what the heck is a gar bar? Then they say, well, that's how much liquid we release from our bourbons every two farkles. It doesn't provide much information. So instead we do what you see colloquially, which is C equals H bar equals one. Okay, let's get to some myths about natural units before exploring exactly what that means. So firstly, one of the myths is that we just simply set 
C to equal 1 to equal h bar. This is a meaningless statement as it's written. And the reason is it doesn't, they can't equal 1. It means we're now using the speed of light and h bar as a reference for some other quantity that we're trying to develop. If you're confused about this now, then that means you're thinking about this correctly because it's not ordinarily explained. It's left ambiguous. Let's look at this. Let's imagine. What is the speed of, let's say, some car on the highway? So the speed of a car on a highway equals, we would say, 100 kilometers per hour. These are the units. And that's the magnitude with respect to those units. So if I wanted to say, what is the speed? Sorry, that's already speed. What is the speed of light? What we mean is 299... Seven nine two four five eight. Again, it's one of those numbers you try to show how clever you are when you're a child by memorizing meters per second. Now look, this is actually what C is. C refers to all of this. C doesn't just refer to the magnitude. C refers to the entirety of it, including the units. So when someone says C equals one, C equals one, what they actually mean is that we are now using units where we've taken that 2997924588 meters per second, and we've placed it in here. So we've taken this guy, and we've placed it in here. See, all of this is not ordinarily explained, and it's because, as an undergraduate, you're especially used to writing with reference to a coordinate basis, which is why I said, try to do everything you can coordinate-free. If you have an instructor, you're lucky enough to have an instructor, you always ask, how can you represent these equations coordinate-free? Another way of thinking about this is that you, we have graphs in physics and math constantly plot, and those etchings are akin to choosing a unit. The fact that we put lines with etchings means we've chosen a coordinate. So these etchings outward are it, implicitly a choice of coordinates. But nature, but if you look again, like I mentioned, there's no detector that can detect the coordinates. Much like if you take a picture with your phone and you then look at it on the screen and you zoom in, you see pixels, the pixels are an artifact of you taking a picture and trying to manipulate it in some manner. The world itself is not pixelated, unless you're to believe Thomas Campbell or Donald Hoffman. Another reason to think coordinate-free is you'll start to construct constructions that actually depend on your coordinates when they in fact don't in nature, and then you'll wonder why you're getting an incorrect answer. So for example, in physics and so on, we often use, let's say, this, and then we represent it in some symmetry. This is how theoretical physicists generally reference matrices. They don't like them, so they call them symmetries, these rows and columns. But then you also would reference this same object with numbers in a similar manner. However, they transform completely differently. So one is an endomorphism, and then the other is a two-form or a bilinear form, and they transform completely differently, And which is why you have transpose, which is a, it's not an ill-defined object, but it's a strangely defined object. The inverse of a matrix is more copacetic, but the transpose is a strange one. So this one is a two-form, a bilinear form, the metric in the, with, in the Einstein equations, is a two-form, is a bilinear form. And also the determinants of uh, endomorphism is a completely different object, it's invariant, compared to the determinants of a two-form or a bilinear form. And then as you start to understand this coordinate-free, you'll realize that there's a special place in hell for the person who developed the transpose. It's an unwieldy object. Another one that will confuse you if you think in terms of coordinates is that the wave function, you ordinarily think of the wave function as going from some RD or some subset of RD to, to the complex numbers, but actually this guy is a section on a C line bundle. And you need to understand bundles in order to understand it coordinate free so that you can do not only polar coordinates and you wonder why the heck does the derivative change well that makes sense when you understand it in terms of a principal bundle and then the associated bundle but also in terms of no longer staying in rd what if you want to move to a curved space for quantum mechanics what if you want to do quantum mechanics on a curved space this is why one should try their best to understand what the heck is going on without reference to coordinates and then go to coordinates when you're actually making a calculation. That's why this is a myth. We just simply set C to equal one to equal H bar. By the way, what is H bar? Well, that's a bit more abstract. You don't need to understand that for the sake of this video. But this is an ill-defined equation. 
There's actually a caveat here that will come into play later. Another way of thinking about it is imagine you have one USD, one US dollar. Sometimes you would say it equals 127 yen. It doesn't actually equal 127 yen, otherwise when you have a US dollar, it would just be 127 yen. What it means is that there's something called value, or some monetary equivalent, that's another way of thinking about it, conversion. What it means is that you go here with some mapping, let's say M, and then here with some mapping that's, that's called, let's say, M prime. What it means is that you do, let's say, M prime inverse, see we have to make all these constructions now, and then and that's after you've already done M. So you've gone from here, and then you go back up there. They're not the same. So another way of thinking about this is imagine you want to change lengths. Instead of using meters, because you think meters are strange for some reason, you want to measure everyone in terms of Lady Gaga. So you have Lady Gaga here, which I'm going to call LG. So now let's say we want to measure someone else. Let's say some, let's say Goku. So what is Goku? Goku equals maybe one and a half Lady Gagas in length. So you take half of Lady Gaga and you stack that again on Lady Gaga and you get a Goku in terms of length. How about Tony Robbins? Well, that's, let's say, two Lady Gagas. Now what we're doing here is we're saying, I'm going to make all my future length measurements in terms of Lady Gaga, for whatever reason. In the same way that, generally speaking, prices can be made in reference to the US dollar, and then you do some conversion to find out its equivalent monetary value in some other currency. In the same way, what we're doing right here is we're referencing everyone's height in terms of Lady Gaga's height. And it's just as foolish as it would be to say Lady Gaga equals 1 equals the USD. Just as foolish as this equation is, it's tantamount to saying C equals 1 equals H bar. There's so much that goes into a statement like that. That's just seeing that gives the impression, oh, physicists are just setting it equal to 1. So no, this statement is foolish and what's underneath that is saying, hey, I'm going to now measure everything in terms of the speed of light. So I want to measure my car. Maybe it's a millionth of the speed of light. I don't know, I don't want to do the calculation right now, but let's say it's a millionth of a speed of light. So then I say, well, the speed of walking, let's say, is 0.000000005, I'm making this up, of these speed of light units. That's what it means. Okay, so this is all including, by the way, this right here, this is all foolish. You have to understand what's lurking underneath. So in this example, the value is what's being referenced. When I see the real world, that's what I mean, is that there's something else that's tangible that I'm trying to represent my quantity in reference to. So from now on, we're going to no longer say that this is moving at 500 meters per second. We're gonna say that this is moving at a fraction of the speed of light. By the way, this should be a definition, and that refers to the entire object there. Not just this, this is just the magnitude, and that's where this is misleading because it's just showing you the magnitude. But how the heck can C equal this in the same way? How the heck can Lady Gaga equal the US equals one? That is myth number one. Now, myth number two is that the advantage. Welcome to the Theories of Everything podcast. You just watched a clip from a much larger two hour video lesson, including what to do with these natural units, such as how to calculate the radius of a black hole in five seconds, no joke, as well as the vacuum energy of the universe, as well as the pressure inside a neutron star, some facts about extra dimensions and quantum gravity. To watch it, click here. And also this video was sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant is a website where you can go to learn math, science, and engineering through these bite-sized interactive learning experiences. I keep saying this on the show and I mean it, that at some point I would like to speak to Chiara Marletto or David Deutsch on constructor theory, and that's heavily based in information theory. And thus, as preparation for that, I went through Brilliant's course on information theory and random variables. And from there, I was able to finally see why the formula for entropy is the way that it is. It's handed to you on high from above, and it looks baroque and highly manufactured, but after going through their course, you can see that it's an extremely organic choice for a formula. Visit the link brilliant.org slash toe to get 20% off your annual subscription. I personally recommend that you don't stop before four lessons. Keep going, even if you feel like you're not making progress on the first, second, or third, go to four, and you'll be extremely surprised that you can now grok what you previously had a difficult time grokking. Thank you.